Thanks very much. Um, I'm Anton. I'm, um, I'm from Canada. I think there was one other person from Canada here. Yeah? So I'm from Ottawa. Um, <laughs> Um, but I grew up in Ireland, so I still have full European rights, uh, thankfully. Um, I'm a developer advocate with IBM Cloud, um, but I have sort of a, an identity crisis because um, I'm also a designer. Um, what being a developer advocate means is that basically I build lots of apps really quickly. Um, some of them are iOS apps, some of them are web apps. Um, I build them for examples to share with our clients, to build with the developer community to find things out. Um, and today I'm going to talk about one of them. It's a work in progress. Um, and it's a hotel app, and we'll get to that in a second. Um, and this is one of sort of four talks I'm giving on it. Um, this is the, the most mature version of it so far, but it's very new. There's a lot of, a lot of things that can go wrong, so I think it's a theme of the day where we're risking a lot. Um, I'm risking a lot with Internet of Things equipment, with iBeacons and other examples. Um, so this will determine if I come back tomorrow or not, the, how this goes. Um, and this is some sort of line art that I've been making for the app. So uh, Michael would probably be appalled because of its, of its lack of color and lack of style. Um, so the agenda really is in two parts. So one part, the first part is going to be about thoughts about what ambient data is and what it means to me. And the second part is going to be some experiments where we're looking at um, iOS working with the Internet of Things. Can I just ask quickly how many of you have been playing with the Internet of Things? The sprinkling of you. How many of you been, have been playing with location-aware devices like iBeacons? How many of you are interested in this stuff? <laughs> okay, that's okay. <laughs> better, better. Show of hands. Okay, feedback. Okay, so what is what is ambient data? Um, well, for me. Ambient data is all about the data that we create just by being people. Um, so there's a gold mine of information, a gold mine of data about us that we just generate in, in things like movement, in our choice of words, in the tone of words. Um, when we get up, the route that we take, we choose to take. There's lots of data that sort of lives around us that isn't really being captured at the moment. And my, my thesis here is that that can really be injected into applications to make them more personal. Um, if any of you were here last year, I talked about this a little bit. Um, I first, first sort of started getting into location-aware devices with a game that I made for a conference, and I, I talked about it at the last Prima conference, but it really got me thinking about, um, about location awareness. Lots of sort of technology around um, personality, uh, insights, and natural language analysis of, of our words, and then health data and fitness data together. Um, so these are all new ways of measuring um, sort of unique data about us, not just the sort of country that we're in, but the room that we're in or the corner of the room that we're in. It's context awareness. It's, it's given us the ability to, to create um, unique opportunities around that, that location. Um, so when we think about all of those, those sorts of types of data, we can learn a lot through sensors and through data uh, analysis. So for example, with presence, um, with our location, the Wi-Fi, motion sensors in rooms, geofencing, eye beacons, and even your calendar can help because it knows where you are, where you should be, or where you've been. For personality, um, your social network, not, not just the things that you're tweeting about or writing about on Facebook, but the actual network itself reveals a lot about you, the connections that you have, the reasons behind why you made those connections. It's telling. It's sort of ambient, implicit data that you make every time you, you follow someone new on Facebook or follow someone new on Twitter. You're actually revealing a little bit about yourself. 
um, your personal settings. Like, so traditionally with applications, what we'd do is we'd go into a settings area and we'd say what color we want the font or what color we want the background. That's old-fashioned personal settings. The kind of settings that I'm thinking about in, in personal information in the future are the settings that you make just by being sensed. The, the things that are detected about you as you walk around or, or move your arms and make choices, they're going to start to influence the apps that you make in the future. And then for pulse, I don't mean literally just your pulse that you measure with a fitness device. I mean all of the sorts of things about your, your body that can be measured, whether it's your sleep patterns, your emotional anal analysis, um, your behaviors, tone analysis, all of those things, and not just footsteps or heartbeats in the cold context of here's what my heartbeats are, but how those can be meshed into applications, into enterprise applications, to be relevant. So, for example, understanding the emotion of a conversation in real time can help uh, coach you about that conversation if you can get feedback of it and an awareness from it. So I'm going to segue into a little demonstration of some real-time tone analysis. So what this is going to do is it's going to play a recorded sample. And as it's playing the words, it's going to um, put them up on the screen. I'm not sure we can hear it because the mute it's muted. But in the, in the area below, what it's doing is it's measuring those words in real time and measuring the emotion inside them. So we can tell in real time what the emotions are in words that are being spoken. So the, the blue line there, for example, is when, this, when these words are, are emanating joy. The red line is for sadness. I think it's one of President Obama's speeches. But it just shows that, like, how you can start to, to build on this in real life, how you can start to take this information in real time. Uh, we developed this for an insurance company um, to, to sort of experiment with their call centers. We probably all have our own call center nightmare. You have call centers in Italy, right, where you can play and if something breaks. So you're hanging on the phone, you're either angry or sad or hopeful. It's a way of being able to tell and learn from that and start to measure how, how we can um, improve. So that's done through natural language analysis. So why does all of this matter? Well, software should never have to ask a question it should know the answer to, right? So, and we see this all the time. Um, I travel quite a bit in my work. I usually use about, I think, somewhere between six and nine different apps for booking like taxis with Uber or hotel rooms or flights or using Foursquare or Hipmunk to, to plan things. And I repeat the same information practically every trip, you know. Um, and I wish that there was something that could gather all of those apps together and just understand me, because it would save me an hour every time of, of trying to figure this out. But software is constantly asking you questions it can know the answer to. So what I'm sort of hinting at through all of this stuff is, is about contextual experience, hyper-personalized experience that understand your location, understand um, your health, you understand your, emotional, your emotions, software that adapts to you personally as, as you figure things, th things out through learning. It gives you a personal user experience. And it's a feedback loop. It senses, it learns, it uses what it learns to predict what, what is going to be helpful to you. It produces that experience. It senses what, how you've worked in that experience and learns automatically and keeps learning and keeps evolving. So for me, the Internet of Things are interfaces for ambient data. It's less about the gadgets than it is about the ways that they can sense and detect what you're doing. It's a nervous system for contextual computing, and that's kind of what excites me about it. So I'm going to give a quick sort of demo of some of this in action with, uh, with an iPhone app. Um, and it's really inspired by a digital key. How many of you have heard of digital keys? Um, yeah, just a couple. So they're apps on your hotel, or they're hotel, hotel room apps on your iPhone 
But instead of checking in at the counter and getting a little plastic card, or, or in my case, I'm staying in a, an old hotel in the city, I've actually got a real key with a big um, key ring on it. Um, these are apps on your phone where you hold them in front of the door and the door opens. So you don't check in at the desk, you just take your app and walk up um, to the, the room and the door opens for you, you're checked in already. So I'm going to tell a story about Robert. Robert's going to take a trip to Vegas. He uses his, um, his hotel app to reserve a room. The app tells him it's going to act as his digital key. As he's flying to Las Vegas, he's crossing time zones. He stops off at an airport halfway between New York and Las Vegas. So geofencing starts to check him out, starts to understand where he is. And that feeds back right into the hotel room app and starts changing the, eye, the sensors, the thermostat in the room, to a temperature that is going to make him happy. So I don't know if you've got the same experience as me, whenever I go to a hotel room, I'm baffled by the thermostat. Usually it's something from the 1960s. It's, I don't know if it ever worked, and I'm there trying to figure out how to get warm uh, in, in a cold room. This is a different way of working with it. It's learning, it understands, like, it understands his preferences as he goes in there. He walks up to the hotel room door and uses his watch to open the door. Um, I was actually one of the guinea pigs that trialed Hilton's digital key. And so I was there with a bag in one hand, a coffee in the other, and my phone. And the door unlocked, and it was pretty cool. It was pretty amazing. But I didn't have any hands free to open it, so it locked again. So I, I think this is a really great opportunity for a watch to be able to take the pressure off having to use your phone. At least you could release some fingers. Um, what I found out in, in building this little demo is that Lo uh, location awareness with your watch isn't quite there yet, it's getting there, and I think probably in the next year it will be. Um, Robert enters his room, the room's dark, um, and, but it's, he, the room knows that he's in there through the internet of things, and so it turns on a light for him. I don't know how many of you have fumbled at the walls trying to find out where the switch is in the hotel in a dark room. This is smart because it also turns the light off as he exits the room and starts saving electricity. I think I actually left my lights on this morning. Um, as he sits down, he figures out, okay, what, what can I do um, this evening? Where can I eat? So the app starts to mine his social feeds, picks out keywords, and, and recommends um, places and events for him. He goes to sleep, yells at his phone to wake him up. Um, yells at his phone to turn the lights out. He hangs his towel up the next morning. Lots of hotels will inspire you to reuse their towels because they want to save money, they want to save on the ecology. Um, but they never measure it. They, you never measure it. You never understand how well you're doing. We have a digital hook in this case through the Internet of Things where we're hanging the towel up and it's, it's measuring his, his reuse of towels. He exits the room. The maid knows when the room is free to, cl to clean. Um, all of his sleep time is logged, his towel use, everything. The hotel starts to understand this. Um, it's learning more and more how to optimize all of its resources within the, the hotel. And Robert Sapp is constantly learning about his preferences, the time he wants to get up, the time he's going to, s to sleep. So now we'll have a little bit of a demo. And like I said earlier, um, this is very much a work in progress. So this is the app that I've started building. It's only really a couple of weeks old. Um, so I can hopefully log in with Twitter, if the network will let me. Okay, we'll, s we'll see if it's going to log in with Twitter. While it's doing that, what I'll, uh, I'll do is show you some of the uh, some of the stuff here that I brought. So this is a, an Internet of Things gateway from Intel, and this little board here is an Arduino board. Um, just get my so you can see it over here. So it's, it's a little Arduino board with a bunch of sensors on it. Um, this is what you use for prototyping Internet of Things um, you know, sensors with. If you went to produce this, say, for a hotel, you would actually have it manufactured for you with custom-made devices. Um, so this is hooked up. 
Hopefully I can show that. All right, everything might be failing. <laughs> so it's maybe the brick is failing, yeah? Okay. Okay, so I'm not gonna be able to show it. <laughs> this is built you all up for that, for, for, for nothing. Um, so I'm really sorry about that, but probably what we'll do is we'll set this up um, outside tomorrow or something. Um, what it, how this would have worked was I would have shown you a temperature sensor or a light sensor. No, it's not shown. So I was going to show a light sensor and how it was changing whenever I shone the, the light on it. Um, the iPhone app actually reads this data from the sensors already. Um, I wanted to share that with you as well. I also have an iBeacon, um, which I was going to show working in progress, but nothing's going to work without the internet, unfortunately. So. It's a lot to sort out. Everything. Oh, we're in. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so let's do this quickly. So um, in this view, what I wanted to do was sort of combine a fitness application with your hotel application. So as well as telling you how many nights you've stayed at the hotel, it's telling you how many hours you've slept while you're there, how many towels you've reused, how many steps you've taken. This is just a standard sort of view of all of your stays. Um, if I go to the... Um, to the sort of room view, it's telling me that the light sensitivity is seven. It's just read that, that the temperature in the room is 24 degrees. So um, do you get um, Mr. Robot here in Italy? Do you remember the episode where he went in and started hacking the, um, the building? He, put, he hid something in the wall. This is how I feel what I'm doing. I'm basically putting a little <laughs> sensor in here and, and letting, letting it read all the, the, the data in the room. If you could walk slowly forward with the, be the eye beacon. Um, I can't walk with the phone towards the door, but we're going to pretend that I am. Instead, the, the eye beacon's coming to me, so it should trigger something when it gets close to the phone. So my hands are, are nowhere near the phone. As you get close... Okay, this bit's not working. That's <laughs> <laughs> maybe... Can do another time? Yeah, maybe I've got the wrong beacon. Um, oh, there it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everything's working slowly, okay. So all of, this, all of this slowness and everything is adding some real gritty authenticity to this demo, so <laughs> I'm really happy about that. So um, what, we'll, what I'll do, just to show you um, this, this in action a bit more, is um, if, I, if I look quickly here, this time what I'll, I'll do is um, I'm going to shine the, the light over here, so um, the light sensitivity should rise up. Oh, it doesn't look like I can do that when the phone's on, and when the camera's on. So now, now it's brighter, um, so if I launch the app again, I might really be pushing my luck trying to get it running a second time. Okay, so, so now we have more light, so if we look at the light sensor here, and I go into the, the light is at, the light's at, oh, it's gone back to seven. <laughs> So that failed a little bit. Okay, so you get you get the, the idea. I think I've I've uh, toyed with the demo gods enough for for one talk. Um, it's not very difficult to use things like iBeacons. Here you can see a little bit of code um, where it's just calling the beacon manager. The beacons that I've been using are from Estimote. Um, you can see um, on. I scroll down to this part saying, did it range the beacon? So it, the thing where it's, it's measuring how close you are to the beacon is called ranging. I'm saying here if it's less than two meters, then pop up an alert. 
um, this could be connected to an Internet of Things device to, to make the, the thing actually unlock. Um, and it's running on a node back end. I'll, I'll show a picture of how all of this stuff hangs together in a second. Um, the the Node.js code to start listening for device events is also pretty simple. So it's uh, connecting to a network gateway, an, an IoT gateway, and the devices in it. And then every time it gets an event, it's just a payload where it's looking for things like temperature uh, in there and publishing that onto the cloud. So just quickly returning to the slides. Um, so this is the sort of functional diagram of how things fit together. We have these sensors that are looking at light and temperature at this little Arduino board, um, which is interpreting the data, um, the sensor data. It's feeding it into this gateway. So the gateway can use lots of sensors. It would be on a hotel floor, for example. And then that's publishing it through, um, through a cloud plugin, in this case, Bluemix from, from my company. Um, it's publishing it to a foundational layer for Internet of Things uh, information on the cloud. And then there's a cloud-based node app that's listening to that. And that's what the iPhone's talking to in the, in the back end. So we got this sort of Internet of Things layer, a cloud layer, and a human layer. And the beacons, you can read about them in the Apple site. So they're used um, in sporting arenas and stores around, around the world. They're dumb devices, really. They just um, transmit a Bluetooth um, frequency, and as you cross that frequency, your phone can react to it. Um, I did want to show some mining Twitter for preference information, and we have that sort of working, but I'm not going to dig into it too much. This is it looking at mine, it's stripping out keywords from my tweets, and it's finding things like I like soccer. Um, soccer is it's probably a sin to call it soccer in Italy, right? It's called football here, but um, gardening. Um, I don't know where it found jewelry. I'm a bit concerned about that, but um, <laughs> it's actually picking out keywords from my tweets, and these are the themes that it's finding. We've built a little um, sort of chat bot uh, in between that and Yelp, and in between that and Foursquare, where we're feeding those, those themes in, the, your location, the sort of things that you're interested in, and doing searches on that stuff. And so it found um, pizza, I think the best pizza restaurant in Las Vegas when I tested it. So this is where, um, where, for me, all of this stuff sort of starting to mesh to together. Data science, marketing, and design, they're how companies sort of work with, um, with their clients these days. And for me, that sort of the sweet, that becomes automatic and learning and personal in mobile contexts through this way of sensing information through your presence, personality, and pulse. And to, some, to sort of give an overall view of, of how I feel about this. Um, in the beginning, this is a picture that many of us probably are familiar with. Um, for in computer science, your first lesson is computers do three things, input, process, and output. Right? And this is what it was like. It used to be pretty obvious what input, process, and output meant. Input, process, and output in 2016 looks a little different. So your inputs come from you know, wearable devices, shopping carts, social media, multimedia, APIs, the Internet of Things through factories and stuff like that. The outputs don't go to big screens as a first port of call anymore. They also go to Internet of Things devices. They go to, to, to watches and wearables and mobile devices. This can only sort of make sense when you pull the cloud in because of the volume of data and the variety of apps. And then we have to start working with, with data differently through natural language analysis, through events, and through deep learning. So that's how I sort of see the world and all this stuff fitting into it. And that's kind of my talk. Thanks very much. I can take questions. <laughs> <laughs>